Hello and welcome to the Random Thought Show. My name's Jacob Tober. And my name's Darren McInnes. On the show, we talk about anything and everything in fitness, high performance and health. Welcome to the Random Thoughts Podcast. Darren, how are you going? Oh, oh. <laughs> jumped over the top here. I'm really good. How are you, Jacob? I'm great. I'm great. Cool. Uh, one thing that's not great, though, is sometimes looking at our junior schedules and it brings a tear <sighs> oh, to our eye and frustrates the hell out of us. It's crazy. Yeah, it's... um. It's when you've got high-performance athletes on low-performance programs, and I, I see this more than I would like. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's something it, it's something really worth having a chat about. It's a thing that people often they'll hear about it and then they will go pretty um, obsessed about it. And I think oh, I was guilty of that at the start. So I want to preempt this with a: you can't let perfect be the enemy of good. It's very rare that you can actually get the perfect schedule programming for a young athlete it's just different because they're not a professional you don't have them full-time uh, so don't freak out if you can't get it perfect but i think there are some principles in here that's interesting to tease out and, and chat about it's about the big picture stuff mm-hmm. it's about going okay well what is high performance how what sort of environment does it live in how mm-hmm. close am i getting to that is there a way i can tweak my current schedule without too much difficulty yeah uh so i suppose we should kick off with what a high performance program looks like in terms of a high performance schedule, I suppose. And should we start with racehorses? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's start with racehorses. So, uh, but I, I, when I think about high performance, what I'm, what I'm thinking about is you want to create a strategic and scientific schedule that is maximizing the short and long term development of your athlete. You want to have something that's in harmony with how the human body works and is stimulating adaptations and just works. And so those three sentences there, maybe not that last one, but those three sentences there are going to scare a lot of people, go, oh, it's too hard, I don't have time for that. But it's not. It's, it's not. actually a pretty simple set of rules or guidelines to follow to get yeah, this stuff done. And, and, and the principle is that when we get fitter, stronger, faster, better, what we how we're achieving that is by applying a tiny dose of stress which causes damage and the magic of the human body is it super compensates its way out of that damage. So you, you do um, 50 squats and you haven't squatted in, in you know, ages and that creates a little bit of damage in the muscles and you're really sore the next day. You're in the alarm phase. Possibly, not always, but sometimes. But, uh, and then some, some people are even more sore at the 40, uh, 24 hours. If you, you know you get that ink. If you've done an exercise that you aren't accustomed to, at 24 hours you go, oh, I'm a bit sore. And then at 48 hours, like, oh, my God, I am really sore. Well, you're in the middle of the super compensation curve, which is just simply that you have, you're at baseline, you have a stimulus, there's some damage, and the magic thing is that at the 72-hour mark, the body is now rebuilding you stronger than you were. Yeah, so you initially have a shock phase and then you recover, and if you allow enough time to rest yeah. that those squatting muscles, for example, you will become stronger, and next time you do 50 squats, mm-hmm. it'll be a little bit easier. Or um, next time you can do 55 squats. And, and it might be running, might be whatever it is. And, and and also to clarify that, you don't have to be sore for this to work. No. Soreness isn't a compulsory part of supercompensation because sometimes athletes get to a point where they're so high up their supercompensation cycles mm. that they're actually not getting sore ever mm. and they're worried that they're not working hard enough. But they're still strong. That just means you're accustomed to your training and you're at the pointy end, which is a good thing. And uh, do, do we have it? Have we got we've got an article with some pictures of supercompensation. I think you've an got article a, or a video. Yeah, we'll, we'll link to chronic well. workload ratio. Yeah, yeah I'm make a note of that. Um, but the concept is that, like, yes, soreness is a good indicator of a workout, but it's not the only indicator. Yeah, I think that's an important. And thing. in season, in particular, you probably want to steer clear of soreness because you want to stay fresh. You want to have those instead of being seventy-two hour cycles. You want to try and have even smaller cycles and try and get less of dig smaller holes. Yeah, so I mean, you, you know, sometimes have a bit of soreness. I think t- you could be too uh, soreness averse and you and you never get anywhere. But you don't want to be like, oh, I can't walk, couldn't walk for three days. Um, I had a, a classic example of that where um, so this was back in 2003 and we had uh, – I was working at the Dandenong Rangers in the WNBL and uh, working with a coach, uh, a running coach, um, Bill Haynes, Lovely guy, very intense. Not racehorses though, Darren. You're, you're heading I'll away. Come back, I'll, come back okay. I'll, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. And Bill was not training like racehorse. He was he was putting a lot of work into the athletes and he was putting it into them often after they'd come from lifting with me. And so my concern was we were really pushing hard. So you were digging, if you if you were pushing them hard after they'd done a weight session, you were digging them into a bit of a hole. And 
sometimes we can be a little bit blind to what kind of a hole you're digging people into because you don't have an experience the stimulus yourself. And he was this naturally strong bloke who'd never really lifted. And so I brought him in the gym and I pushed him moderately hard because I wanted him to sense what it was like to be in the bottom of that hole. Uh, and he couldn't walk for four. Like he came into training the next day, he could barely move. He's like, what's he done to me? I was like, yeah, that's, that's what our athletes are doing. You're adding on top of that stuff. So you do have to try and treat them like racehorses. You have to try and race them. You know, the, the famous one is Bart Cummings, one of the most famous horse trainers in the history of Australia and one of the most successful in the world. Like he's an amazing horse trainer. Phenomenal number of group one wins. Yeah, if you just backed him at the Melbourne Cup, you did you did pretty good. There's some odds on that. If you just put 100 bucks on his horse every year, you'd yeah, be a pretty you'd, wealthy you'd, person. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and the thing is, he was famous for training his horses lightly, because the thing with horses is they can't they can't tell you they're tired. So you have to really if you, if you if you're training a human, you think logically, well, they'll just tell me when they're feeling tired. Except the people don't like to win very often, particularly athletes. Another topic we'll get to in a second. Yeah. Uh, so what was I? Sorry, horses. Um, horses not whinging. Yeah. Upcomings being amazing. Yeah. So if you're training a person they won't necessarily tell you uh what's uh what how they're feeling what's going on um but the cool thing about training horses is you you know they're not going to so you have to really respect those principles and uh that's why it does so well because it's just he has this fundamental principle let's apply a dose of stress and then let's get out of the way and so compared to a lot of other trainers he would under train his horses in prep for major comps Mm. and major races Mm. and so they'd be under what the rest of the world thought was underdone but actually they were just maximizing their the taking advantage of minimal effective dose mm. and really making sure they're maximizing their recovery between each workout yeah so a, a great high performance program is going to apply the dose get the dose right so not too much not too little uh, have the right spacing and you might have different doses of different stresses overlaying so um, because everything has to supercompensate your bones ligaments muscles uh, your nervous system has to come back up everything has to has to bounce back so it's it's that thing uh, I love that I can't remember who said it but he said Every day is a um, kidney workout. Day. Every day, every day is kidney day. Yeah, yeah. That idea that our kidneys have to process the protein, including the waste protein that's broken down inside mm. our muscles, and so you might be training back and then legs and then shoulders, but your kidneys are still processing every the, day the waste proteins that are a result of you yeah. breaking down those muscles. And, and probably in in sport, the the more applicable thing would be to say every day is a nervous system day. Mm. Every day is a neural day, yeah. Yeah, and, and so you do need time for that to, to come back up. And the, I mean, the classic there was um, we had an athlete. So that's that's what a high-performance schedule looks like. You're allowing time for all those different traits to recover and you have athletes that are fresh enough that you can push them hard enough to get consistently great results. The, the key part of that is that recovery is factored into the program. Yeah. That's the difference between a high and low performance. Yeah. This whole episode in a nutshell is right there. Yeah. High performance programs have recovery factored in. Yeah. And so one of my favorite examples ever that was at, uh, um, a, a young uh, athlete who went away on a holiday, like a school camp thing, to the Great Barrier Reef for two weeks, did no sport came back and was dunking way better than when he left. Basketball. Yeah. Basketball, yeah. And he said, well, how is this possible? I haven't trained for two weeks. Like, yeah, your nervous system got two weeks off and it got to come back up uh, and get really fresh. So, it's, yeah, it's very interesting. Because the supercompensation we typically think of is a matter of days, you know, 24, 48, 72-hour cycles. But you can also get into a stage where you're over overtrained is a whole thing. But more typically, athletes overreach where over the course of multiple months, they just lose a percent or two each time they don't recover enough. Yeah. And so over the course of many months, they go from running at you know optimal 100% down to 85%, but it happens so gradually they didn't notice. Mm. And so then they're given a big chunk of time off, school holidays, a trip Bounce to the back. Barrier Reef, and then that nervous system's like over those two weeks – just shoots its way back up and, and then you get back cool. on court and it's like, whoa, check out the bounce. Yeah. And so, yeah, so before we get – we're going to get into low-performance programs in just a moment, but to be crystal clear, the high-performance one, it's challenging them, it's pushing them, but it's doing it by actually leveraging the recovery time. That's actually when you get stronger and better in many ways. It's – the damage is done during the session, but the magic happens when you're asleep, when you're on the couch, when you're watching telly, your body actually rebuilding itself is where a lot of it happens. And, you know, I, I got an email this week from uh, uh, an athlete who was massively overtrained, doing running every single day of the week, not a day off. 
And it just struck me that, wow, you've, you, you have high performance aspirations, but you have a low performance strategy. You're actually on a low performance program. And if you said to that athlete, hey, uh, would you like to buy this special low performance program guaranteed to blunt potential and maximize injury risk? They'd go, no, I don't want that. I want maximal potential and minimal injury. Uh, but so many people are on these low performance programs because a really big part of it in junior sport is the inability to say no and the inability to control the overall structure. So pro sport, classic example. Sorry, go ahead. Before we go there, I think we should jump to an Iron Edge pro tip yes. because low performance programs are going to be a whole thing we're now going to unpack yeah. the different types <laughs> and different ways. Let's go to a tip. So let's have a quick break. Let's go to an Iron Edge pro tip and we'll be back shortly. Great. Hey guys, it's Jacob here on the gym floor with another Iron Edge Pro Tip. When we think about high performing programs, athletes are doing everything they can to get the most out of their bodies. Foam rolling is one of the most common tricks we use or tools that we use to help our athletes take an active role in their recovery so they can get more out of their body, accelerate that recovery, and then improve their performance you know, in the short term, but also in the long term with that, you know, that chronic effect it has on tissues. Now, one of the newer things that's come out in the, vi in the foam rolling space is the use of vibration technologies. And we've got three toys here that we're gonna show, but I think when it comes to using these vibration technologies, it's making sure we're not just treating them like gimmicks and actually using them how they should be used to get the most out of them on a, not just you know, playing around with them every now and again, but on a consistent, regular basis. The first tool is a vibrating foam roller. It just looks exactly like a foam roller, but you press the button on the end, or you press it a few times and you can create different frequencies of vibration through the roller. Now, we just use this like a normal roller. So you do your normal rolling routine, but use the vibration to dig a little deeper and get into those adhesions and those trigger points. So just roll as you normally would. What's nice about the vibration though, is if you go a little slower, you can use less effort and use the vibration to do most of the work for you. So you don't have to do the work running up and down the roller with your arms and with your legs, you can just let the vibration go to work, moving a little slower through the muscles. Our next tool is called the Theragun. This guy, again, has multiple speeds, five speeds, and it's got different head attachments, so you can get either specifically in, or like we've got here with the, with the larger ball, you can get a more broad roll. What's nice about the Theragun is handheld, obviously, so you can be more specific with it, and also you can hit those hard to reach places that the vibrating roller doesn't get. So VMO is a great example. You can turn that volume up, get a little more intensity into it, and then work through your VMO right next to that patella to loosen it off. You can do the same through tib post, and then maybe on yourself, or if you get a friend to do it for you, you can get through your upper traps, rotator cuff, pec minor, areas like that. So those areas, they're a little tricky to hit with a, ro uh, with a regular roller. The Theragun comes in great handy for that. The other one that comes in handy for hitting those hard to reach places is the ball. So the, the vibrating massage ball. Same thing, just press the button, turn it on, multiple speeds. And then you find the spot that you wanna hit. Great for glute med, great for TFL. And what's nice about the ball compared to the Theragun for hitting isolated spots is you can really rest into the ball. And you can put some weight into it and relax down into the ball have it resting against the ground and then switch off and relax. If you want to get these vibrating tools to incorporate them into your training program, we have an exclusive offer with the guys at Iron Edge. Follow the link in our bio on, I on Instagram and use the code word VIBRATECA when you check out to save $85 on exactly this pack here. Vibrating foam roller, vibrating massage ball and the Theragun as well. So low performance programs, they take many different shapes, many different sizes. Mm. What's the most common one we see? I think it's the... Well, you've seen more of them than I have. Yeah, I just think it's the, I can't say no to anything. I can't say no to anything, so I'll, I'll do everything. And so it's training every single day, training multiple times a day. And, you know, it's just a, at best, you have mediocre improvement over time in terms of your athletic development. And at worst you have a stress fracture or you have a muscle tear or one of those sort of spontaneous uncoordination exhaustion ACLs where you just kind of, you. It's had, this happened to a, a thoroughbred athlete that we trained uh, who was doing unfortunately 20 plus hours of sport a week and just um, 
basically had a spontaneous dislocation of the ACL just from, you know, like, you know, when you're really tired, you just get unco and you bump into stuff. And sometimes, you know, again, like the neural mm. fatigue, you don't really notice it creeping up on you. Mm. You don't notice yeah. that you're exhausted. Yeah. And, and it's sport. Like the, the reason you got as far for the elite and semi-elite athletes, the reason they've got as far as they have is because they push through fatigue. They grind it out. They get it done. That's in their DNA physiologically and psychologically like that that's the thing it's not like uh there's no slogan of oh just quit when you're feeling a little tired take a day off you'll freshen up it's just not there's no nike slogans for that <laughs> nike just have a day and go to the beach <laughs> you know it's just not really that yeah yeah and uh so that's that's the big issue is that those guys just push and push and push so i think it's it's people that want to do they athletes want to do everything and they need someone around them who actually is going to modify them and say, actually, no, probably that should be a day you, you have off. High performance team. High performance team, high performance manager. Um, the classic and one of the best uh, programs in terms of that was uh, back in the day with the Rangers where we had out of a 28-day schedule, the athletes were off legs for 14 days out of 28. So 50% of the month was off legs. <laughs> Yeah, in, in, a, in a couple of blocks, it was it was that that high off legs. Sometimes it would come up a little bit, but there was a, it was a lot of time off legs, uh, and they thrived. Uh, very low injury rate, high winning rate. Um, people will make the case that well, you can't do that with juniors because you're having to develop. And I agree with that. You mm. can't have that much rest. Yeah, that's not a. Everyone should only no, do fifty no. percent on legs. Uh, that that's, that that's, that would be very counterproductive. Uh, but everyone should do. I think. I think the absolute minimum. Should be one day. A week. I think if you are if you have a program that does not have one day a week of total bone rest, where you're not having ground reaction forces and impact forces, uh, then that's that's a low performance program. So you can have all the fancy stuff. You can be coming along to our gym. You can be doing this. You can be doing that. You can have your high pressure bodysuit recovery and your all your nutrition, nutrition dialed in perfectly. You can do everything perfectly. But if you're actually not getting a day off legs then you're on a low-performance program. And you, you might be able to mask that with all the other things because they're going to make you not as sore and so forth, but you've got to have a minimum one day. Um, and ideally two. Two is Five lovely. Five or two off, yeah. You know, like if you could have, you know, uh, Sunday and um, Tuesday off, that's now going to look like a pretty great schedule for, for a lot of athletes, mm. uh, which sounds ridiculously simple. Um where we were, we were the other week, we were at that uh, terrific event put on by Vald. Mm-hmm. Um, Part of the Sports Tech Conference. Yeah, and it was um, from the NBA, was it, is it um, Blake? Yep, Blake. Yeah. I've forgotten his last name, but Blake yeah. uh, from OKC. Yep. Yeah, and uh, and he, he was talking about how when, when he came into the program, what they realised that there were stretches where the team was uh, 21 days consecutive on legs, like 21 days on court in a row. And so one of the one of the biggest improvements they made was just going. Well, we're not going to do that. We'll we'll have you off legs, yeah. um, which is it, at the pro level. At the pro level, the athletes have made it, so they don't need to be working on all those little things mm. at the same level a junior mm. has to. Mm. But they also uh, like the team. Like you know, players are getting traded, players are moving around. They got in you know sports like the NBA. You've got structure and tactics and things like that. You have to get right. So the trade off is. Do we give our guys rest or our girls rest mm. um, or do we get out on the court, do some X's and O's, go through some strategy and some tactic mm. stuff? And it's like, well, do you need fresh athletes or do you need switched on athletes? It's Because mm. it's not it's, – there is no perfect program, which is what the, mm. the, the summary of this episode will be here in the end, is that, you know, every, you have to work with what you've got. And so the situation there was it's like, well, in this 21 days straight, there has to be a day where we don't do legs, where yeah. we get op- no running, no jumping, you know, Light recovery, massage, pool session. Mm. That's it for the day. Mm. Just got to find a way to get that done. Yeah, and uh, and I think the the real trick is is not to focus on having the perfect program. It's just really make sure you're not on the worst program. <laughs> you know, like just, it's just, just step one. Just don't ca- do terrible. You know, carve out a day, and if you can carve out two days or one and a half days, that's that's terrific. And people people will respond really well. Um, so that's your base level. I think if, if you're designing, a, if you're trying to get away from a low performance program, um, it's important to know what you're getting away from. And what you're getting away from is, if you ha- if you are on that go every day low performance program, you are going to have a massively elevated risk of overuse injuries, uh, stress fractures, 
tendons, Osgood schladders, and, and like Osgood's a classic one where people, people will say, oh, it's just because you're growing. It's like, yeah, but... Everyone grows, not everyone gets Osgood. Uh, yeah, so like you're growing, you're definitely magnifying the potential for you to manifest that injury by going at it, by never giving it a chance to recover. Mm. Um, it's not, it doesn't have to be one, one or the other. I had, um, I remember I had an, an athlete who was 16 years old who'd, uh, who'd stopped growing a year prior because girls often slow down growing early and had six games of basketball in one day as sometimes like a, like happens. A school, as, tournament school tournament type of thing? Yeah, yeah. It, was, it, was, it was a school tournament. Uh, and then the physio and went on the physio had a bit of soreness around the knee and they said, oh, you've got Osgood Slatters because they didn't ask what she'd done that day. It's like, yeah, six, days, six games in one day. So a low-performance program is going to expose you to a lot of unnecessary risk, pain and low, and low performance. Uh, that, I think that's the big thing is it's, it's not just injury risk. It's also doing more isn't actually going to lead to greater improvements in your game. Yeah. So if you're a basketball, if you're a footballer, playing more games, getting more kicks, getting more shots up is not – when you're doing more jumping, whatever it might be, is not necessarily the answer to – Poor performance. Yeah, and in fact, like, it may exactly the exact opposite. It's and, and it's it's a bit of a um, a great footy example is you're trying to develop high accuracy and power out of your kick. You want to be able to kick kick goals yeah. straight through the middle of the sticks, or you want to be able to kick a long way, or you want to be able to hit a target as and they run towards you. Right? Well, what you do is you practice that in a relatively fresh state with reasonable breaks. You don't go out and kick for six hours, you don't kick till exhaust you don't kick until you can't kick anymore. That's not how you get better. That's it's that's not skill acquisition. That's mm-hmm. not strength. Um, but it's kind of like we sort of think, oh well if we just go till we can't go. In a gl- more broad global sense, yeah. 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 Uh, so if you're trying to build if you're trying to get a, a framework for a high performance program. So step one, one day minimum off in a perfect world, two days. Yeah. Uh, and I would I would include in that one or two days off that because uh, people are like oh, off legs, well, I'll do boxing then, or I'll do. Mm. It should also it, you should try and have one of that day be a off nervous system day. Yeah, because if you're playing a high impact explosive power based sport, then yes, off legs for your bones and mm. your tendons are going to be great. But also having that day mm. be off high intensity for your nervous system yeah. would be great as well. Uh, the only sort of uh, counter to that is if the only day you can do strength training is that day off, uh, don't be like, oh, I, I can't do strength training because I've got to have a day off. Because you, strength is your number, it's the frontline defence against injury, it's the, it's the building your base, it's building your, your foundation. So you've got to prioritise squeezing that in somewhere. So in that case then your off legs day and your off nervous system day may be different days. Yeah, and you, and you just might not get such an off nervous and as, as, as you'd like because um, you know, a, high, a high performance program without strength training is almost as bad as a high performance program without rest because mm. uh, you're just not addressing the, the machine. But then I would say the high performance program without a nervous system day rest is also not a very good idea either. Yeah. You need to be getting that in there too. So day off legs, incorporate mm. strength training and make sure you get the nervous system rest in at least one day as well. Yeah, so they that, don't have to all be on the same day. Like, yeah. we, you know, depending on what your schedule looks like, you work them in around there mm. and go like that. Mm. Um, and often, you know, like if it can be, a, if it can line up with your schedule that it's also just a cruisy day, like if it can, if it, if, if it works out that that can be, you know, Saturday or Sunday, that's one for, the, or, for or, the nervous system day. Yeah. Yeah. And like do skills, mm. work on your handballing, work on your touch, work on your shooting. Mm. Okay. Fo- footy clubs do a great job of that these days. Mm, I think they, they are. Um, there's Aussie rules football clubs are some of the best. I suspect in the professional world at tracking and monitoring the load, at making sure they're not overtraining, and actually getting that stuff right. And having having craft, you know, putting in craft days, where they, which is what they call skills for our international listeners, uh, having those days, um, but not actually taxing the the system that hard. Where you get some kicks, you get some X's and O's, you get some tactical work in, some yeah. touch, but you're not hard gut running, not hard sprints, mm. not tackles, not weights, stuff like that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so you get your rest, you get your basic strength stuff addressed. So you've got you've got that quality. Minimum one lift a week. Yep. Mm. Uh, I think then it's 
I mean, it's not, it's not like you do one than the other. So it's, it's a bit of an artificial construct. We have to talk about these things in order because you can't talk about them all simultaneously. Yeah, time but, is a concept that we have to obey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think another thing that's worth, worth talking about is uh, just getting your sleep, just getting good, good quality sleep for a reasonable amount of time and, and being in, in a good pattern, mm-hmm. which we've talked about before, so you can circle back to a couple of episodes about that. Yep. We've covered that well, but it's, it's a really important ingredient because it, it, when you are getting that sleep, you are – really sort of um, really stifling the potential for things to go wrong because you're just getting that maximum regenerative capacity out of your body. So it's just it's just a great simple thing you can do. Exactly. Really um, big deal. And then nutrition, obviously, that's really important. I've said that a million times. What do you think – what else do you think in terms of a high performance? I mean, I think, I think, I think that probably the, the missing piece in, a, in so many programs that I see is – the mindset. It's like we address how to shoot, kick, run, pass, all these things. Uh, we address the the fitness, uh, but I think a lot of high performance programs are actually missing the missing a key ingredient, which is the development of of mindset and mental skills and and mental and emotional resilience. The mind, the mental side of the game, is so much twenty nineteen onwards. Probably 2017 onwards, the last mm. two or three years, it's really started to come into it. I think it's going to be the next frontier for all sports in the next decade. Mm. It's going to be huge because mm. what we still see across a number of sports and a number of situations is athletes not handling the pressure, mm. basic fa- basic failure to execute skills, basic failure to perform what's required under pressure, and it's so trainable. Mm. It's such a thing that can be fixed and worked on with some deliberate actual attention. And yeah. the nice thing is it can be done on your rest day. Yeah. It can be done uh, in bed yeah. before like before you go to sleep. We, the problem is we don't have we don't have there is not a consensus yet on how to do it. There's not a knowledge on how to do it. And I think such a new frontier. It goes to the heart of someone's psyche as well, that stuff. So it's so so close to the bone. Um, but the way I'm thinking of it more and more is it's just we, we, don't, we don't see someone who's not particularly good at, at kicking the footy and go, ah, well, some people have just got it, some don't. We go, you know, okay, this, here's how you hold the ball, here's how you drop it, follow through this way. You know, we, we teach, we break the skill down and, and we teach it. But we're so Col- – Collingwood supported bias here, but Mason Cox – Came over okay. here from America, played yep. college basketball, came yep. over here to play footy. He's six foot eleven. He's athletic. Collingwood took the time to teach him how to kick. It's yeah, like, that is a worthwhile investment because of his athleticism. We yeah. can make a football out of this guy. Yeah, which so, is all, which so, is so we do that with motor skills. Why aren't we doing that with mental skills? Yeah, uh, and it frustrates the hell out of sports psychs. It drives them them crazy. It's like we we're here. We know how this works, and uh, it's such an important area. Where would you start though? I, I mean. I, well, actually, I do know where you'd start. Well, before before we start, mm. mental skills, mindset stuff is a whole range of things. We're mm. talking about mindfulness, meditation type practice, mm. learning yep. how to be present, learning how to block out stress, control your emotions. We're talking about visualization mm. type skills, well, like practicing the skill in your head, you know, memorizing the steps, all that mm. kind of stuff. Um, there's others like. I'm not a psych, mm. so it's not exactly my strength. But yeah. there's there's a whole range of different specific skills within this very broad category. Mm. So where would you start? I would start with the easiest one that doesn't involve trying to unpack someone's psyche and and you know Get what happened to them when they were three. You know, like just just the one that's just straightforward. Let's just visualize. Uh, I've I've done it. I've had athletes do it. I had an, an athlete. A professional athlete who was also doing a sports science degree, a double degree sports science and sports psych. Uh, and uh, she started doing visualisation stuff. She was learning about it, and so she said, oh, well, I'll give this a go, and her shooting percentage went up by like 10% that season, and she shot the lights out. She's like, this stuff just works, and it's really simple. And it, uh, I'll, I'll teach it right now. Like it's the most basic stuff. Um, so uh, what you want to do is get yourself into a – so I suppose the, the fundamental concept is that if you are sufficiently uh, detailed and intense with your visualisation, your brain can't tell the difference really between a visualisation and the activity. So visualising you, uh, good examples, foul shots in basketball, 
visualizing yourself shooting foul shots is in many ways going to be almost as good as actually shooting foul shots. Because it activates the same neural pathways within your brain that actually happen when you shoot the shot. So when you shoot the shot, you know, the parts of your brain that control your fingers, your elbow, Mm. your wrist, your hips, whatever, Mm. they all activate in a certain sequence and a certain Mm. level. This, If you can vividly and accurately visualize it, you activate the same neural pathways. Mm. So you might not be training, training, you know, the wrist extenders, for example, but you are training the neural pathway connected to the wrist and extenders. The, and, it's, and, and so much of it is about the feeling of how does, how does a good shot feel coming out of your hands? How does a good kick feel? It's, it's that feeling of it. Golf's, it. Golf's a great example as well. Golf swing, yeah. Like, like when you... When you connect, it's like that was a, like before you've even seen the ball. Like you you, have, you connect with the ball, it's like that's good. Mm. You can just tell the, the rhythm and the timing and the weight shift. Everything was right. Yeah, and so you can visualize that. Yeah, and and it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty straightforward. So uh, the way I was taught was that you want to um, slow down your brainwave activity a little bit. So it's relax, um, just kind of relax, and it's um, breathe. So start at sixty and breathe breath per count. And count your way down to zero. So just really kind of get into a relaxed oh, we, state. So we breathe. So, so 60, 59. So, so number on the exhale? Yeah, n- number on, on um, both. So inhale. Or you can start at 30 and number on the exhale. But it's, inhale, 60, 60 exhale, exhale, 59. 59. And just work your way down. So it's gotcha. going to take you. Details are important here. Yep. Yeah, it's going to take you a little while to get that. And I imagine you could probably get similar benefit by starting at 30. I, I, yeah. I think it would still work. But the point is just stick with your example though because it, it's a good base and then people might find little deviations that work for them yeah. within this. So you just kind of calm things down, do that, and then uh, it's such a cliche but you try and imagine yourself in a really relaxed, happy place. So imagine yourself on the beach doing whatever, just really, really happy and just feeling kind of in just a nice place. Imagine the bead of sweat on your on your arm. Like really feel it. Like real. And and what you're doing there is you're just strengthening kind of that mental muscle of visualizing. Best, best to do this stuff on your own. Yeah. Um. And best to do this stuff eyes closed. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. And so you can really focus. And then what you want to do is you want to imagine the wherever you practice or wherever you play. And so you're in the that place, and you are visualizing. You can smell. You know different. Uh, you know, different grounds will have a different sound or a smell. Different um, courts will have a smell. Like you, you really uh, smell the wind, the um, everything you can do to be at the most v- just really, really intense visualization of your being there. And then you imagine yourself shooting, kicking, running, whatever it might be, and you imagine the feeling. You imagine yourself feeling fatigue, so you, you you spend some time doing it. Like it's not just like you do it for you know a tiny bit and do it. You imagine yourself feeling fatigue, but still pushing through it. And you imagine scenarios and fatigued so, but calm and and, like, and just in the zone. And so and, and you imagine the crowd, everything you need to do, um, and it can have a profound effect. Fascinating thing is that Michael Jordan, uh, greatest basketballer of all time. Uh, he was doing that from a very young age without even knowing no one taught him. He just intuitively did it. So the shot that he credits to changing his life was when he made the game-winning shot at the NCAA. In North Carolina, yeah. Yeah, and he talks about how that, that day on, on the bus he was in kind of a half-asleep, half-out, almost trance-like state and he was dreaming about making the game-winning shot and he would often do that. Uh, and so he was actually, um, without a lot of effort, rehearsing and, and developing that, uh, which is crazy that you can do that. And so, and I think you take a thousand athletes, and like three of them are doing that. Mm. Uh, people will have a, people will dream about you know uh, hitting a six for Australia in, in, in cricket or whatever. They'll, they'll they'll talk or they'll think about that, but really doing that detailed, getting that brain weight into that into that there's, state. There's a difference between dreaming about something and having lived that moment in your head over and over and over. Yeah. And like the best athletes, they do that. They mm. like live and breathe, you know, not just the moment, but the details and the specifics yeah. and the lead up. And it's the stories they tell themselves that the, I've got this, the, you know, that's why those are the guys that the guys and girls that, that want the ball when the game's on the line because they've, they've been here already. They, they, they want to do it. Uh, and I think it also uh, it applies to business. I think um, 
one of, since I'm, I'm sucking up to you, one of your best traits has always been you've just had this, it's all right, pressure makes diamonds, I can learn how to do this thing. I, and like your self-identity is I can do stuff. Uh, I can I can do anything until proven otherwise is your mm. ingoing mentality. By default, yeah. Yeah, um, which is a really good, it's and particularly good in the age of, of, of Google because, you know, 30 years ago that was more difficult because you couldn't go and find out how other people, you had actually to drive to someone's house. Yeah. <laughs> how and did fly you to America and, and watch them and see. And how did you do this? Whereas now you can just you can work out how to do pretty much anything if you have the right mentality and the, and the patience. Yeah, YouTube's a pretty amazing place these days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think that mentality that they that they build is is really powerful. And visualisation, people are like, oh, it's all voo-voo and woo-woo and all this kind of stuff. But... It's just a habit. It's mm. just a habit and a practice. And it doesn't have to be as, like Darren just talked to a very specific, detailed way of doing it. Mm. But it can just be like the Michael Jordan thing. You're just sort of dozing on the bus, dreaming about making the game winner. Thinking about it. How's yeah. this tournament going to go? Okay, I'm, I mean, I'm going to yeah. come off the bench. Or I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing this or I'm playing with this player. If it's a golf tournament. It's like one paired up with this person. Like, oh, they shoot first. All right, what's the first hole look like, that little dog leg? And then mm. make sure you stay away from the sand. But if I am in the sand, this is what the sand shot's going to look like. like well, the big thing is um, – the huge thing, and this is where sports psychs, uh, obviously this is, we are not playing in our own area. The, the most important thing, one of the, the critical things is not to say make sure you stay away from the sand. Ah, uh, yes, you're right. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> no, that's Sorry, really, golfers. Um, uh, no, I'm really, glad, I'm really glad you brought it up because that's a natural thing. Like, yeah. Well, I was trying to stay away from this, but I accidentally went there, so now we have to do it. <laughs> uh, so the worst thing you can say is don't miss because then you actually trigger that neural pathway of missing. Of and, tightening up. And so the great athletes, you know, and so many of them, you know, they could miss whatever their sport, they could miss 10 in a row and they're like, next one's going in. Yep. They just have that mentality. It's a, it's a very big – we've been a bit basketball-centric this episode. Apologies yeah. for that. But it's yeah. a big basketball thing. It's like the best shooters, yeah. uh, whether they're one from 30 or they're 30 <laughs> from 30, the next shot's going up. Yeah. The, 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 the only bad shot's the one you don't take. Yeah. It's yeah. a Kobe mentality. Which drives coaches crazy sometimes. Um, I love in, uh, that, in the Lego movie uh, when that man – First try. Got a first try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's um, – it's really important that you don't worry about. You don't think, don't miss, don't choke, don't do this. You just like, I've got this, and you just focus on the on the outcome you want. Because the thing with that, it, it's a basketball thing. It's a shooter's mentality, but it applies it's a kicker's mentality. It applies it's, across all sports. It's a but, spiker's mentality, but the, the, server's mentality. Sorry, <laughs> you done? I <laughs> done. <laughs> the thing is, though, when you when you unpack that and you go, okay, oh, it's so selfish. You're shooting all the ball. It's like unpack it and look at it for a second. It's like, well, what's the alternative mm. for an athlete who's a professional, who's the, you know, who has proven themselves and got to this level mm. by being good at what mm. they do? What's the alternative? Oh, sorry, guys, it's not my night. Well, I'll pass everything from now. Well, and I, I think what's a really important distinction is that it's not about the, that mentality making you shoot every shot. It's just if you're going to shoot it, don't think, I'm going to miss. Yeah, it's not, it's not saying every time you get the ball – yeah, it's not saying, oh, I'm 05, I better shoot the next Every 10 shot. shots to get out of this. It's just that if you're going to shoot the shot, it's really important to not say, don't miss. Mm. It's not that shooting becomes, it's not like a compulsory green light. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just if you are going to do it, do it right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that, it's that thing of like, well, okay, I'm, I'm a profession, I'm professional, mm. I'm an amateur, whatever it is, I'm playing this sport, I'm competing this thing, the game is won by doing X skill. Mm putting, shooting, kicking, whatever it is. It's mm. like, what, you're going to get to the green and go, sorry, guys, don't putt. I yeah. missed a couple of putts now and yeah, I'm not just, doing that anymore. It's like you, you have to yeah. step up to everyone and you have to fake it till you make it with that Kobe mentality of, okay, let's go. And yeah. fresh, fresh, clean slate. What's a good one look like? Visualise, success. They're going in. It's you know, Watch the and, hill, watch the this. And those guys, yeah, they're, they're hyper-competitive and hyper-confident. Um, but then they have this other side which is, really low in confidence that makes them practice really hard to make sure that they can, you know, like they're obsessed with, you know. It's pr- broad perfectionism, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. So I think that that having some level of that, even if it's just um, five minutes a day, you'll actually be streets ahead of a lot of, a lot of athletes because people are it's, – it's a missing component. It's, you, get a, you do get a fair bit of that in professional sports settings, uh, but you don't get that in, in the junior settings as well. Yeah. So, um, and that is a very, one of the parts of your high performance program. <laughs> it is definitely, an, yeah. So, it's kind of become a two part episode. So, well, I reckon we rest, 
strength training, sleep, nutrition, mindset, um, and addressing the technical side of actually just are you are you getting are you practicing the skills that you suck at? Mm, I think working on weaknesses. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and and some people will go to overboard with that, and they will will spend all this time working on thing they're probably never going to be good at, it's like, or a thing they're never going to use. Yeah, um, but the idea of, of of as humans, we're really we're most comfortable when we're practicing the things that we're already good at, and it's so uncomfortable to do the things that we aren't good at. Good jumpers love jumping. They'll just jump all day, yeah. and what they should be practicing is maybe their their um, passing or their lateral or their, or their fitness their, or something yeah. else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the only way the area where I've seen that go wrong is you've got someone who is a wonderful, thoroughbred, fast twitch athlete, mm-hmm. and they consistently test poorly for endurance because they are all fast twitch fibers. Yeah. Yeah. Not all, not no, no, all no, in the oh, literal sorry, sense, but in the, the, the yeah. In a figurative sense, they are so fast, which dominant, mm. and then well-meaning sports scientists and S and C coaches like us uh, go, "Oh well, you know, your yo-yo sucks." So bring we've, up your VO two. We've really got to bring up your VO two. Probably just um, accept that that person. The reason they can do those amazing things is because they are a fast, which dominant athlete, and you make sure their their VO two max is is good, but you don't risk um, blunting that. That instrument, you don't risk making that Ferrari slower in the chase for a little more fuel efficiency because there is a trade off there. There is mm. a, trans, a a negative transfer effect of too much long, long, slow conditioning work will compromise your type two explosiveness and mm. will dampen mm. that explosiveness. And they have a term for those athletes now, we call them impact players. Yeah, <laughs> and impact players are a total don't you know, touch them <laughs> important part and a, a role player within your team. They're not going to play, you know, thirty minutes a quarter for your AFL team, yeah. but they are. We call them impact players, and they're great. Leave them as they are. Yeah, and and, and some you, and you program for them differently because that's their genetic makeup. Yeah, and often, you know, the, the, we come back to the, the problems with sports science too. Often, the ways we need to test whether someone is fit enough are these really steady state things, which don't have much. Um, in common with the actual demands of the sport. So you can have someone who, you know, you do your battery of, of cardiovascular metabolic fitness testing and you go, oh, you're quite low. But you watch them play and you're like, actually fitness is not hampering them in the game. Mm. It's just ranking them lower in the, in, in the testing. And on, in the game they find ways to work around their lack of fitness. And so it's like – By being smarter and yeah. conserving movement and being efficient, yeah. Yeah, so it's like there's that there's – that you know, thing that one of my favourite questions in, and, and you had a, a long discussion with, um, with a parent of an athlete this week who was on a massive low performance program, mm. oh, uh, hours and hours of work and no recovery, and no, recovery. no strength. Yeah, and uh, and the question that you wanted to ask was, all right, how's that working out for you? Yeah, you, you've got all these excuses and reasons for why you're doing this. You've called me for my help. I've offered my advice. Oh, we can't change the program. Well. How's it working out? Well, how's that going? Like, yeah. why did you call then? Yeah. What was the point? Yeah. Whereas, and it's kind of like the reverse is you've got someone who's really explosive and really good, and it's like you go, "That's working out well for you. Keep doing that with a little bit." Yep. That's not. It's not necessarily a weakness that you're going to go overboard trying to fix because you're going to you're going to rob from your strength in order to offset a weakness that wasn't actually costing you anything. We have this obsession with finding things that need fixing. It's like, well, go watch a game. Does that need fixing? Mm. Yeah. Oh, they can't really kick on their left side. Okay, well, we'll work on that. But are they amazingly quick and really good at getting to their right? Cool. They're good. It's not like we have to pull them out of the team until they can kick on their left. Yeah. Bring it up slowly, but let's focus on the strengths as well. So Mm. it's a bit of both. Mm. It's it's that balance. So I think if you do those things, if you've got your your rest, your strength, your nutrition, uh, if you've got your mindset, if you're sleep, and if you're getting, if you're attending to the technical stuff, um, and then. Probably the very last Wrap it is all up. To, to tie it all in is some level of character development. That that thing of 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 working on working on the you project, which is Craig Harper's title of his podcast, which I love. On on on, on what are you like? So um, you know the classic is that you can have athletes that, that are incredibly focused on all of their athletic stuff, but they're not actually focused on on who they are as a person. And eventually that will cost them in in sporting terms. 
So their identity um, is just, I am a sportsman. Yeah, and then if, if you have an injury, then that's really problematic because it gets wrenched away from them. Um, or if you don't make it as high as you want to or if or you retire e- early. Even if you make it. I mean, uh, the the classic was um, the the cheating sca- scandal with Australian cricket with Steve Smith where he's, as a cricketer, as a batsman, holy hell. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Unconventional, but phenomenal. Phenomenal. So he's right up there with... Bradman now is second uh, second highest average test career of all time. I believe yeah. Yeah. Bradman's ninety nine. He's in the fifties. So there's but, a big but, gap, but, but he's the second the best. Second best. Yeah. Um, believe, yeah. And I think he's the only player to score consecutive double centuries in an Ashes. Something like that. Something yeah, like, like a bunch uh, of stats, bunch of records. Uh, particularly when he's come off a year's um, enforced break. Uh, but let's not call it a break. Let's call it let's a call suspension. It. Let's call it what it <laughs> let's is. Call it. it sounds a bit of Aussie bias there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no Aussie bias. Did the wrong thing, uh, but. Some form of um, of leadership uh, training, of some form of more intense um, self development over com- over developing comfort with confronting people about stuff, may well have saved him from that scenario. So it's that knowing. You know, there's a saying: uh, the right thing to do is always it's, the right thing to do is always the right thing to do. And I think that's often the missing ingredient for sports people is that self-reflection or development of their character because that will, if you go well, you might be a captain, you might uh, be in situations where your character ends up being an important thing that supports your whole athletic base as well. How do people work on that? <sighs> that's a good question, Jacob. I think it's, um, it's, that's, it's trying to work on that self-awareness project. I think it's, it's that sense of, okay, what are my tendencies? And, you know, like if I'm tending to be, like for me, I'm a really bad loop starter. Like I'm a great loop starter and a poor loop closer. In terms of projects. Yeah. So I know, like I have a million ideas and I want to go after them all simultaneously and you are the voice of reason that comes in and goes, let's Durham, do two things. Let's do two well. things, do them well, finish them. Finish them and then God we'll sense. do the third thing after we've finished the second thing. Yeah. Because I'm like the guy who just keeps throwing more plates, you know, the, the circus with the plates spinning. Just more plates up on the sticks. <laughs> yeah. so. That's and so, um, so if and I'm bad enough as it is, but imagine how bad I would be if I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Right. Mm. Uh, and so it's so it's knowing that that self awareness, and and then I think the other element is knowing the trying to be aware of what the you experience is like. So if if you are thinking about how your presence is in a group dynamic, because a lot of athletes in team, and I think this has gotten worse the last decade. With phones. Yeah. Big time. Th- Big I, time. I, I think – and so what it means is in the, same ways, in the same way as now, if you can read books, it's like a mild superpower because no one's reading books anymore. I think if you can be really good at being self-aware around the, what the you experience is like around others, because people aren't developing that awareness because everyone's – you know, like if something socially awkward is happening, you can just sort of dive into your phone. Because it used to be that if you were at a tournament – you're playing for the Victoria and you're just state, state you're national championship and you're off at the tournament. You're there for a week with your team and your managers and coaches mm. and everything. And you've got two games, you've got morning game, mm. afternoon game, and then you'll go for dinner. It used to be that you'd all sit at dinner and just talk and you'd chat and, and you'd have food and you might have a food fight and you'd pick on one guy or one yeah. person or the coaches or you'd, you'd, you'd mm. stir each other up. And then you'd go home and you'd go to a movie and you'd talk about the movie. And But now it's like everyone goes to dinner together, but no but, one's actually at uh, dinner yeah. together. And I, I mean, I was, um, I was lucky enough to, to step over that fault line in history uh, and notice it. So I, in 2006, um, teams were teams and, and you would go out and you'd had, it had unless you brought a book, <laughs> you, you all talk to each other, you know, and then three years later. iPhone was released in 2007, the first one, yeah. Yeah, 2009, you're at a team barbecue and um, there's – you know, 14 athletes there and 12 of them are on their phone sitting around the barbecue not talking to each other. And for reference, 2009 was pr- pretty much pre-Facebook. There was no such thing as Instagram, I think, so even then. I think it must have. Well, maybe it was 2010 then. Um, whatever it was, there was definitely Facebook by then. No, well, Facebook might have been around, but it wasn't very big in Australia at that point. Maybe it was 2011. Whatever it was, it was a, it was a short enough period that I just went, We're talking about one Olympic cycle here, four years. Yeah, yeah. things really, really changed. Um, but the, and so that's, you know, you can moan about that being a sad set. It, it is what it is. Um, but what you can do is you can stand out more as a great leader if you're actually paying attention a little more and being a little more present. 
So I think that so paying attention of, to both yourself and your teammates. Yeah, and that kind of will wrap everything up and make you uh, a better leader, a better teammate, uh, and ultimately for most people. The whole point of sport is to make you a better person because only very few people are making their living out of it. Most of the time it's actually kind of a mechanism for developing lovely character and teamwork abilities. Camaraderie and, and friends. And, and just all that other stuff. And so it's going to make you better at that, which is which is a nice thing. Mm. Mm. I feel like that's a wrap, yeah? Yeah, let's uh, get on those high-performance programs, mm. take, take a little time, reflect on everything, see where you're at, and then um, – Start working on the U project. Yeah. <laughs> which is a really important thing. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. See ya. And before you go, hear from our alumni about the online mentorship. I learnt the theory stuff at uni, but I didn't know how to apply it. And coming to Core Advantage was how I, I bridged that gap. So I, I knew the stuff, but I didn't know how to do the stuff. It was something that I needed to do personally for my own development. And it's allowed me to work in elite sport for now five years. So it was a massive help. I think mentorship is really important and being able to ask questions all the time and the Core Advantage course allows that because there is a big team of people that you can ask questions. I get to um, you know, train professional athletes every week, um, work really closely with professional athletes, which is awesome. A lot of the skills that I'm applying, uh, I learned through the program at Core Advantage. It's not just something that you read and then think about and then go, oh, how, how does that tie into everything? It's, it's something that you, practical that you can turn around and go, this is exactly how I'm going to apply it. Um, and the concepts that you learn help you as a, as a coach, as a professional, as a person. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Definitely go and do it. Semester three of the mentorship is now open. Apply at coreadvantage.training mentorship.